would you say there's a holy grail in wholesale nursery as far as like sustainability goes? If you could solve it, it would like unlock so much potential. I think there's three. One is the water. Yeah. How do we how do we use less water? Two is the plastics. And then the third is chemical use. Hello, my friends. We are talking about horticulture as a career today. And speaking of, we have Ryan McEnany on the show, who I just saw three or four days ago at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show. So clearly someone with a career in horticulture, a fifth generation family member leading marketing at Bailey Nurseries, also a garden designer, also an author and a spokesperson for Bailey's brands. So Clearly you have not only one, but like seven careers <laughs> in horticulture, Ryan. So why don't we start off with a bit of an introduction. Something I found interesting at the show we were just at is how many people came up to me, Jacques, saying, I now am working in horticulture because of watching your guys' stuff. And so if someone's interested in that, maybe we could just go into your background and how you got into this. Yeah. So I I grew up around plants. Uh, I grew up working in, in production in the fields, then started helping out with some events around the nursery. Uh, my I'm a fifth generation family member at Bailey, and so I, I it's like in my blood. Uh, but then I got a degree in communications and started my career in a, a totally different industry and started working in entertainment in L.A. And like a good Midwesterner found my way home. And uh, even at that time, when I was still working with some of my entertainment clients, I started working a little bit at a time at, at Bailey and started doing, this was 100 years ago when social was sort of new for brands. And so I started doing some social media for our consumer brands. And then it just like, it felt like home. And especially coming from an industry like entertainment to come into a space where we're like doing really good in the world and surrounded by really great people that just care so much. There's so much passion in horticulture uh, for what they do. Uh, I've now it's been 10 years since I've been back full time at the, at the business. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. An interesting return, so to speak from kind of like the Hollywood lifestyle, I guess. Right. Yeah. And you know, it was great. I lived out my early twenties going to the, Oscars and, you know, having wow. really amazing, cool clients and building some really iconic TV shows and movies. But, you know, that's that's fun in the moment. And now what we do is just so differently impactful. Mm -hmm. How does someone get in? So you you obviously fifth generation is quite some time. So fam familiarly speaking, you've been sort of bathing in this field for quite some time. Um, how does someone Let's say me, you know, I came out with a business economics accounting degree, didn't know I was going to be into gardening. Imagine I got my hook into gardening in college. Like, would I have wanted to shift my degree? Is there a path in uh, that's like easily followable for someone? I think what's so cool about our industry is there's so much opportunity. Right. And a lot of people on, on our team don't have a horticulture background and either they really like plants themselves and they you know have a few house plants at home or they knew the the name of the company or they drive by and see the fields and like that's really cool but there's so much in it whether you want to like be a grower and be really hands-on and like actually go get your degree and and learn all of like the plant biology behind it or you can find your way in in other ways whether it's in marketing like we are and then start learning the trees and the shrubs and the perennials from there. Um, so I, you don't have to be scared off by not having a degree in horticulture or botany. Uh, there's so much opportunity that, again, this is such an industry of passion that if you care about any of this, this world that we live in, people will find a place. And the other thing that I think is so cool about our industry is that we're all teachers. Mm -hmm. We all love to share information. So if you don't have this background, you're, it's like the perfect place to land, right? Because there's so many people that want to share it. And like, that's what you have built this whole business on is being able to just share that information. And we see how voraciously people eat it up and love it and want to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting now, I would say, I guess I made my own career in, in horticulture, sort of without without knowing that's what would happen. But now, of course, we are a business that employs a lot of people who 
they're passionate gardeners or maybe aspiring gardeners, but they're also marketers or their customer service reps or their logistics and operations people. And so you don't have to have a degree in horticulture to have a career in, in horticulture. You're, you're totally right. I mean, these businesses need skill sets that every business needs. You know, we have a lawyer, you know, <laughs> so, yes. and, and he just started his first garden like three weeks ago and he's really excited about it. And so who knows, maybe he'll, he'll delve in and get even deeper into like the law of, patenting or whatever right and so there's yeah. a lot of different a lot of different ways this could go um when when you came back to the business where did it start for you i started in a space that i knew i was doing social and pr mm-hmm. and i didn't really know anything about plants and i had to learn it and not long after i came back i became spokesperson and so like that's where you really have to be able to if you can get in front of a camera and answer questions about hydrangeas or whatever it is you have to know your stuff and so that's sort of how i found my way in and from there like really into the plants and doing design and all these other pieces but kind of like you like you learn by doing it and because this is um such a welcoming space people like to help you get where you want to go even if it it does become something like we've got a tissue culture lab so a lot of the people that work in tc don't have plant biology backgrounds either but they love it they found it interesting and they came in and they they did the work to learn it yeah yeah i think that's it it, it's all learnable right it kind of goes to what we talk about at epic of that black thumbs don't exist it's just you would never say like i don't know i have like a black spatula or something i can't cook right (laughs) yeah it's, it's all it's well understood that's a skill set and, and much like gardening it's the same thing um when when you did you have other stories i guess it whether it's at bailey or, or other people you've met in the industry of people who just kind of come from nowhere uh nowhere related to gardening and, and gotten into it there are so many that uh a lot of times at retail especially but that call this their second career yeah. They develop sort of a passion or interest in gardening, even if they don't call themselves a gardener, but they started buying and growing their own fruits and vegetables, or they started, you know, beautifying their space at home and just kind of started to love it. And then retired from their their first career and and started getting into it. And we see that a lot with garden centers. Uh and again, it's I said it before, but it's a, an industry of passion. And I think that's why people don't even consider it retirement. Uh, we had a really, really amazing guy who actually was a, a second grade teacher at what was Bailey Elementary right down the street from us, um, who the original Endless Summer hydrangea plant came from his yard. Oh, really? And wow. after he retired from teaching, he came and worked at our propagation facility kind of part time, but he just loved being around it. And he was so connected to the plant, especially the hydrangea, that he spent another 15 years working in the production and propagation area just because he sort of, by happenstance, had this plant that now is the best selling collection of hydrangeas in the world. Yeah, that's wild. And so I don't know hydrangea botany super well. Like, is that something you, you basically have to tissue culture to continue to propagate or? No, it's all softwood cutting. It's oh, wow. hydrangeas are actually really easy to propagate. Okay. Uh, the hardest part is, especially in the breeding work and within the summer being reblooming, being able to make sure that you can extract that that remontin to reblooming gene. Mm. But yeah, the propagation itself is really pretty darn easy. What's a wholesale nursery? Yeah, we're like the company behind the brand that you love. It's like the Procter and Gamble. Like you may you might know P and G, but you probably know their brands a lot better. It's the same for us. We're like where the plants start. Mm-hmm. So anything from like propagation or tissue culture and starting with those really baby plants, getting them to the state where they're in a container like you would buy at a garden center. So we're that sort of behind the scenes effort to get everything started. So does that mean, and these, these wholesale nurseries will specialize, right? Typically in flowers, vegetables, trees, et cetera, or are you guys more across the spectrum? Yeah, a lot of a lot of companies, a lot of wholesalers will have a pretty specific focus. We are uh, <laughs> one of the crazy few that kind of do a lot. Uh, we really focus in perennials, shrubs, and trees, but we do everything from the small plants and the tissue culture liners um, to container plants to bare root tree uh, trees and shrubs. So we're kind of all across the board, but. 
We don't do annuals. We don't do a ton of edibles. We also do a lot of fruit trees um, and some strawberries, asparagus, uh, those sort of veggie fruits. But it's not totally in our wheelhouse, but we got to have a little fun in all of them. And we try and be a, a good resource for our customers all across North America. So we try and get them as much as they can uh, while still providing the best quality product within our expertise. Sure. Yeah. So maybe talk me through this. I mean, I know that you have this Eclipse big leaf hydrangea that's kind of the thing right now. And yeah. if you're a nursery man trying to produce this, I'd love to get nerdy about like just the growing of it. Like how does that, how do you scale something like that up to make ostensibly like, I don't even know how many you were like millions of them. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And as you know, every plant has a little bit of a different recipe and how you, how you grow it up. But part of what we do in our testing is like, can we replicate this and keep the, whatever makes that plant unique? Can we keep that trait? But it all starts with one and whether it's tissue culture where you can replicate really quickly or start softwood or hard, hardwood cuttings, depending on the plant, you, you, it grows exponentially, but you start at one very basic number. And so uh, we've got multiple farms all around the country that allow us to have uh, like a diversity in our climate. So we can grow a lot better in Oregon. We have a lot longer growing season than we do here in Minnesota, but that's what allows us to scale too. And having different size plants, you know, from a little cutting all the way up to a three, five, seven, ten 10 gallon shrub, we're able to then start propagating a lot more off of some of those big plants but it takes us a long time to be able to bring plant to market it can take us 10 years to bring a new plant in and a lot of that is just that propagation stock buildup. that's the piece that i think a lot of people myself included don't don't really get when you look at the plant world and you look at new varieties even when you make one you have to get enough of the stock to create more of it so that you can create more of it uh, and, and even that can take a lot of time, depending on what the particular species of the plant is. It might be easier, let's say, with an annual veggie or something than it would be right. with yep. like a, a hydrangea, perhaps, or certainly a fruit tree would, would yeah. take years and years and years. I, I always reference the story of the Clancy potato, which we do sell at Botanical Interests now. Um, but it's out of uh, a producer, I think Bejo Seeds produces it, and this guy Peter, and I met him and he was like, it's taken me 20 years. Yeah. Make this Isn't it crazy? Yeah. It's like triploid genetics on the potato yeah. and it, they can't, <laughs> something about the way those genetics work, which I'm not knowledgeable enough to d directly explain, but basically something like they can get it consistent within a population of potatoes, but they can't say that like every potato seed is the exact same genetically, but it's close enough and stable enough that they can call it a variety. Um, which it's fascinating and, and a, a huge achievement to even be able to grow a potato from a yeah. true seed in the first place. Yeah. Well, and like really behind the scenes when you're thinking about like, how do you make this a business model that can work, right? For uh, someone that's introducing a new plant, there's a lot of time, effort, and money that goes into it. And so to be able to scale it and understand what the demand is going to look like, like can we sell enough of these to make it even worth introducing um, is is really hard. And part of that just goes into how can we propagate this? How can, how quickly can we get it to scale, but also make sure that it's the right genetics, that mm -hmm. it is high enough quality, um, that people are going to be really interested in it. Yeah. Cause if you miss, it's a really painful miss, you know, it's like, yes, a it is. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have stories about that as, as you, I mean, fifth generation of, of Bailey nurseries and you guys are really well known, I think for your hydrangea lines, Ryan. Yes. And specifically that endless summer one we talked about earlier, but you have this new one, Eclipse Big Leaf Hydrangea. I'm not really a hydrangea guy yet. <laughs> Maybe I will become one after this. However, like what I'm curious about is just how do you make a new one? Yeah. And the the confusing part about this, right, is like some of these new genetics is where do they come from? And so the the remontancy, that reblooming trait, like we talked about earlier this week, for in the summer was kind of a happenstance mixed with a little bit of breeding work uh, at, at Bailey Nurseries and with our partner, Dr. Mike, Dr. Michael Durr. But then sometimes you get kind of a weird, unique thing that just pops out like Eclipse, like we're going to talk about. Eclipse hydrangea is the first garden hydrangea that has this really beautiful, dark purple, almost black leaf. Mm. And you can start to see some of that maybe in the different generations of breeding work that's being done. Uh, 
but it can be a really long process through multiple, multiple generations to be able to get exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've, I've studied this in various different areas of the plant world. Like I was just researching the car, car orange, and at least my understanding right now is that it, it is either a Washington Naval cross with some sort of blood orange in Venezuela, or it was just a Washington Naval orange. There's something called a bud sport that can happen. It's just like <laughs> a total random mutation on the yep. exact plant of a Washington Naval. And so like one random bud just happens to mutate. Uh, and then if you're smart and catch that somehow, and then, and then yep. propagate that via grafting, you actually have that new variety genetically identical forever. I yeah, guess we had, on sports we again. had a really weird one like that. Um, a lot of people might know the name Tiger Eye Sumac. Mm-hmm. And sumac, especially in the Midwest, are planted in every roadside in the world. Oh my- and we used to have, and we still grow, a lot of just species, uh, Rustafina. And someone in our uh, our inventory department 25, 30 years ago was going through and counting and saw this one that was chartreuse instead of green. Mm. And he almost threw it away. And then went back and grabbed it and was like, this is something that's unique and different. Let's see if we can replicate it. Yeah. And now it's one of our best selling plants ever. And it was just a random sport that was growing in a field here in Minnesota. It's so weird and in a way comical, I guess, like the games of Mother Nature, where you can be spending all your time trying to perfect and perfectly select via, you know, human intervention basically, this new eclipse hydrangea, let's say. And yeah. then nature can kind of just skip you and randomly perfectly mutate the thing that you wanted um, yeah, and, which, and which, laugh at which, us while doing it <laughs> yeah exactly um so okay so let's go back to the eclipse as the example here was that that one was produced via direct selection or was that like sort of sped up by one of these mutations yeah it was a uh, direct selection and you know it's like high school going back to the punnett square and we have breeding objectives of course that we're working towards um but this this purple leaf was one that we had been trying to work towards and we're getting closer and closer Um, and then the seedling for what is now eclipse was originally uh, selected in 2016 and Mm -hmm. so it's taken us from 2016 to 2024 just to continue working on that and do all of our testing before we felt comfortable getting there but it was just originally from this block of over a hundred thousand seedlings that we said there's that dark purple that we're looking for I mean, if you guys are listening, 100,000 seedlings that may or may not have even had the quality yeah. you're looking for at that level. It's just such a, it, it's funny. This is what keeps fascinating me. So we had, um, we had Tom Spellman on the show recently, who's really well known for backyard orchard culture. Yeah. He works at Dave Wilson Nursery. And similarly with him, it's, there's all this work that goes into finding the variety, but then nature kind of gives you this nice out of generally being able to propagate it genetically, identically via tissue culture or via, you know, softwood cutting or whatever. So it's like, it kind of says, Hey, if you find it, you can keep it, but good luck finding it basically. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's a numbers game. Yeah. And that hundred thousand, we're doing over a hundred thousand every single year. And maybe we get one new one to introduce every year. Maybe yeah. it's every few years. Um, so it's like somewhat intentional based on our breeding objectives, but a lot of it is, is whatever we're given. How do you know? So let's say the, the eclipse that you found in that batch, how do you know that just because it has the color, it doesn't necessarily mean it traded off something else that's negative, right? Yeah. Like it doesn't last as long or it needs more water, whatever. Yeah. So we'll take that hundred thousand. And we'll narrow that down eventually over a couple of years. It'll take us to get to about 50. And then from there, that's where we're checking really all along the way. But by that point, we're checking, does it maintain that leaf color that is so important? Does it flower for this one? Since we wanted that rebloom, does it flower on new growth? Does it have any disease issues? If we throw it in a greenhouse and treat it like every other, does it start to drown? Uh, So we're checking all those things along the way. And then we get to the 50 And then if we get 25, maybe from there, then we will start to replicate it. And so then are we, then we're seeing, does this actually carry all those genes forward? Can we put it into into a nursery setting and actually produce this plant in a pot? Mm -hmm. It goes in the landscape at all of our facilities all around the country. We have licensees that are able to propagate as well. So they'll do some advanced testing for us. We send it to universities that we've got relationships with garden designers that we've got relationships with, because we need to know like, 
not only can you propagate it, but can you grow it in a, in a nursery setting and does it perform in the landscape yeah. in different climates? Because especially like a big leaf hydrangea, you can plant it almost anywhere in North America, um, maybe not Southern Florida. For a big leaf hydrangea that you can plant pretty much all across North America, it's really important to do all of those different testing steps just to make sure that everyone that buys this and puts it in their yard is going to have success. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's again, I, I'd always just marvel at the fact that you can even make a new variety with all these sort of conditions. So it's really fascinating. Hopefully this has given you guys a, a picture on what it takes to get that cool looking new flower into the nursery every single season. For an industry that is called the green industry, it is sometimes interesting. I've, I've marveled at this at least that some of the things that it does could potentially be seen as not so green. So we just learned the scale and scope of what Bailey does and many other wholesale nurseries do around the country, Ryan. And so when you think about that as someone who's working there, do you look at the industry sometimes and go like, huh, like, why are we doing it that way? Yeah, we we certainly do. And especially with our team, we like to take a step back as we, we promote this green product, right? And being able to take that step back and and look at how we got here today, especially for us, over 120 years, a lot of things have changed. I mean, the in the industry, when you look at the container that you buy in the nursery, they call them cans because they started growing plants in tin cans. Mm. And that's evolved, of course. That's uh, That wasn't a very profitable way to do it, but it was also not super sustainable either. And looking even at how our industry operates right now as we look at chemicals and water use and plastic use uh there's a huge conversation about looking not only within our industry here looking at partner supporting uh industries in the u.s but also overseas to find ways to to do better yeah to be really green yeah yeah it feels like with scale sometimes you you lose efficiency in certain parts of a process right like if you look at industrial agriculture obviously you say, well, I can get an insane amount of corn out of this field, but to do yep. that, I have to do X, Y, and Z that as an externality to that might not be so great in a hundred yep. years. It's fine today. It's not so great in a hundred years. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. So are there things that you guys have done or you've seen the industry do to change some of those practices or are there things where you're like, man, we wish we could change this, but literally nothing is better, even though this isn't that good. Yeah, there, there are a lot of things that we look at. Water is such an important resource. And like you're saying, like some of it maybe doesn't matter as much today as it will in 100 years. For us in the Midwest, water isn't as big of an issue as it is you know, on the West Coast. Uh, but we have growing locations in Oregon and Washington that it is a really important issue. And even for like landowners, water rights is a really big deal. And so we've changed all of our our production from overhead watering to drip irrigation we save an incredible amount of water it's like 80 percent recapture wow plus just even like the infrastructure of how we build the farm so that when we do get rain we can recapture that goes into a retention pond gets cleaned and trying to make sure that we're cleaning without chemicals and using copper ionization and things like that to help clean the water and then reuse it on the plants those little things, while they're really expensive to shift to drip irrigation, for example, we get a lot of water recapture, a lot of water savings, and better, stronger plants because you're putting water right where the roots are rather than watering the gravel that's around. Yeah. So those little tweaks make a really, really huge difference. It's interesting to think about it at your guys' scale. Or, you know, we did a tour of a tree nursery that produces tons and tons and tons of trees and watching what they do. And then I just think about my own garden in the aggregate, you might say that the backyard gardener is the biggest wholesale nursery in the world. You, that's one way you could frame right. it. And so then you think, okay, well, how should we be communicating on how, how to water well or how to mix the right soil amendments, et cetera? Um, I'm curious, like, is there a better solution for shipping plants around the country, whether they be <laughs> edibles, annuals, um, than than a plastic pot is there one yet or not really this is one that honestly we really struggle with there there's a solution that exists for annuals that proven winners has put out that's biodegradable you can just plant it in the ground great um 
for a, a category like ours, like shrubs and trees, that a tree might take eight years from when we plant the initial seed or stick the initial cutting until you buy it in a garden center. You can't set a biodegradable pot outside and water it for eight years right. or it's going to fall apart. So looking at opportunities for you at least using recycled materials in the pot. And then there are some places that will now take nursery plastic and do that recycling. Um, it's really important to ask the question wherever you're dropping it off where that goes from there because sometimes it doesn't always find its way and ends right. up in a landfill. Right. Uh, but there's a lot of effort being put in to finding a better solution. Um, even like the, the tags that you find on plants are plastic. But we work with a company called Hip Labels that uses all that's all recycled milk jugs that are going into the tag that then they can also recycle. So it's a, plastics is a really, really huge issue. Um, but we're as an industry lo really looking for better solutions and hopefully uh, finding some opportunities to partner with our federal government on research to to get us away from using so much plastic, uh, yeah. as well as just changing our production practices and things that are that we're not actually shipping out. Can we change from using just a raw plastic material to something that is more sustainable mm. on you know this wholesale side of the business as well? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Are there things like in the world of the plants themselves where you're saying, well, if I could if I could breed a plant that needed less water and looked the same, right? If I could breed a plant that needed less fur and looked the same or could be more pot bound, for example, and would do better, I could theoretically not have to pot it up. Maybe one of the five steps of potting up, I'd lose one of those, which means that 20% of the pots are gone or something like that. Yeah, definitely. That's a huge part of our breeding objectives. One, looking for that, like what's happening in the world with climate change and looking at plants that are more drought resistant, uh, that not even just for those areas that really experience a lot of drought, but even for us in the Midwest, where we still have a fairly significant amount of rainfall, we know that that's changing. And so making sure that, again, that breeding is such a long-term game, anticipating that, but also looking at plants like we introduced a, a different hydrangea last year called Popstar, that it the its flowering potential, because it has tight internodes, is so much faster that we don't have to do all of the steps. So we're able to bring it to market a lot faster, and we can skip sort of that inner uh, growing stage and go right into the bigger pot, which when you're selling millions of hydrangeas, that all adds up. That's huge, yeah. Would you say there's a holy grail in wholesale nursery as far as like sustainability goes? If you could solve it, it would like unlock so much so much potential. I think there's three. One is the water. Yeah. How do we how do we use less water? Two is the plastics, and then the third is chemical use. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation around neonicotinoids uh, in the last five ten years. Uh, Bailey is neonicotinoid free, other than when we are required by certain states to do a drench, uh, or they, they require us to do an application. We do a drench so that we're not spraying anything. It goes into a separate house so that we don't have pollinators in there and it's yeah. an insecticide. So we're yeah. making sure that they're not absorbing it. But that's another thing where the chemicals, if we take neonicotinoids away for certain things, the chemistry that exists still is from the 70s mm -hmm. so like we go while well, we are taking one damaging thing away we're then going to really old chemistry that's also really terrible but probably just in different ways and so making sure we're having these kind of really hard conversations around chemicals because they can have a place when they're used properly but as a wholesale you know organization being able to say this one you know nicks for an example is can be really, really damaging when misapplied. So let's just pull it out where we can. Yeah. And so that's, you know, one step. It's not the final solution, but it's a big step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to talk about stuff like this sort of frankly, instead of jumping to one or the other side of the equation, I, I, it's something I've always done at, at Epic is like, look, let, let's just like understand what we're talking about before we like paint something with a terrible or an amazing brush, yeah. right? And you, you could say the same thing about, the lack or decent level of understanding about like hybrid seed, GMO seed, yes, heirloom totally. seed, land race seed, et cetera. So hopefully this was interesting to you guys listening. Why don't we start off with landscaping themes, trends? What are you seeing happening like today, 2024? One of the things that's been really fun to see, and it's 
when we look at talk about trends, we look inside and outside the house because they all have to work together. And one of the things that's been uh, sort of ironically perfect for us is this idea of golf gardening is such a big trend this year. And we call it gardening in dark mode. Uh, and with Eclipse coming out with this really beautiful dark purple black leaf, it fits really well into it. And I think with it, at the core of it, what it really means is we just want to make a statement, whether it is doing like that really beautiful dark dark black siding almost on your house or doing this in your landscape, either with a monochromatic design where it's all dark leaf plants, or you have a dark leaf plant like Eclipse as a hero and then surrounding it by really beautiful bright colors and flowers. Um, it's, it's about making impact. And especially as we have navigated out of COVID and people are really trying to establish like, what do I want my space to look like? Because we've spent a lot more time there. I think that's sort of what has led us to this moment of a little bit of drama. So I think that's one that's been really, really fun. I, I like that. I mean, I think that's, I think that's cool. I haven't done it, but I could see myself doing it. Absolutely. Just to like kind of mix things up a little bit from the, all, all the colors, so to speak, which I know is, yeah. you know, it's just every, every trend is sort of a reversal or a reaction to the, the prior big thing. Right. And yeah. so perhaps that's it. What, what about specific varieties or specific species? Obviously you guys have some, but like just in general, what are you thinking people are going to be into? Yeah, of course, like hydrangeas and roses are two of, in the shrub world, two of the, best-selling all around the world um they're they're ones that have that nostalgic factor that is really important especially for people that are just starting to buy plants the nostalgia is important but the newer varieties that have been introduced by us and by others in the industry are just better and different and fun and they have something new like eclipse with the 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 leaf color or like a hydrangea with a lace cap flower people are really interested in that but I think what the other thing that people are finding is they want something unique and different. They can make something that's really cool. So there's plants like buttonbush that not only are a native species to North America, but they've got this really cool, like we have one called fiber optics because the, the flower on it looks like the end of a fiber optic cable. So stuff like that, that like they can make that is, that feels really unique to them um, that when they're entertaining or they're posting pictures on Instagram, it can be like, they can get people to ask questions like, Oh, what is that? What's that? Yeah, exactly. And there's like, there's this sense of pride around the, the space that you build again, inside or out, there's that sense of pride of it. And so if you can do something that is, that's fun and different, I think that people are really, are really into that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think I've certainly gravitated toward that, especially in my earlier gardening years, let's say years one to four ish. I was like, what's the weirdest thing I can grow that is yeah. <laughs> what's the weirdest thing I can grow that is a tomato still. Uh, and I would try to do that like Chinese five colored pepper. And, and now I've gravitated towards almost like a total split where I go, I'll try some weird stuff, but I need my tried and trues that are going to work for me. Yeah. Obviously that's yeah. annual veggies. What about, um, are there like trends or things that you've seen where you're like, what, like, why is that a thing? Yeah, I mean, I think that that even with this like goth garden dark mode that people are trying to bring in a lot of plants that maybe don't fit in their area. And like part of that's like the personal thing. They really like that. Um, but trying to then understand how it then fits into their overall design theme. And like, is it that they're trying to just do something really fun for a year versus trying to build like that long-term sustainable landscape? It's been interesting. And I think the positive side to it is that garden centers are starting to play a little bit more and doing some of that zone pushing, especially as we've experienced like the USDA zone changes uh, this right. this year, right. um, that that people are, are playing a little bit more and the garden centers are giving that the permission to do it with the plants available. What I'm hoping we'll see, because we've talked about zone pushing, even just with fruit trees, we had David the Good on a couple years ago, and that was my first introduction to that concept in general. And hopefully as like the general backyard gardener populace gets more knowledgeable about how to manipulate their environment and, and structure yeah. it so that the plants can grow where they quote shouldn't, you, you might start seeing a really flourishing of different varieties in markets that may, normally no nursery would buy it, but they're like, Hey, people not have grown here now. So let's, let's sell it. Right. 
Well, and to me, the the USDA zone thing, like it's just a starting point. It's not yeah. a hard and fast rule. And we just went from zone four to zone five in Minnesota, and it was because over a thirty year period, our our over average temperature changed by like 0.6 degrees. So it doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden we can just grow all this zone five stuff, but in the right spot, you can. Mm -hmm. We grow Vitex in some of our neighborhoods here in Minnesota, which is very much a zone seven, eight, nine plant, but we have one that's been overwintering every year because it's sort of tucked in. It's in a spot that gets a lot of snow protection in the winter, even in years like this where we don't have some. And so they get the freedom to to play a little bit. And now we've got some garden centers that are bringing things like that in so that people can try it. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool to see, like, obviously I'm in a pretty favorable zone. So zone 10B, <laughs> the stuff that we, we have zone out. envy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of that, especially with, with the comments, you know, uh, <laughs> what we try to do is we try to normalize these plants. So like this one actually isn't for cold zone or whatever, but I've seen people pull stuff off. You wouldn't believe like I've seen passion fruit in zone six. I've seen, you know, dragon fruit in zone six. I go, okay, well you show me how you did that because that's, <laughs> yeah. I, would, I wouldn't have figured that one out myself. And so people are definitely yeah. figuring this stuff out. And if we talk about landscaping, I want to give you a chance to talk about the book field guide to outside style. I'm either, I have one or I'm going to pick one up pretty soon here because like i said it's like on my mission this year to just get <laughs> design style aesthetic the vibe because i yeah. historically just like underappreciated that and now i go oh it actually you actually feel better when you're in a nice space so <laughs> yeah. magical realization there so <laughs> what was the book all about yeah and the book really came for i was writing it for like me of 10 years ago so we talked about how i came into this industry not really knowing what i was doing and because there's so many people that started buying our product during COVID and having this conversation with my family and friends and my siblings, friends that were buying their houses for the first time, like, I really want a space that I can be proud of, that's beautiful, that looks great, that I don't have to do a ton of work in, but I have no idea where to start. And so that's really what the book was all about, was helping give the tools to understand things that maybe aren't the most sexy, like soil, like maybe not the most fun thing to talk about. I could talk about it all day long, but like maybe those that aren't a gardener might not think that it is. So using those and then design elements like texture and scale and all of those pieces that can be really hard and intimidating and like breaking that away and having some fun with it. And so I break it out into dates that you get to have at home. My life revolves around food and drinks and stuff. And so what do, what do you do on your coffee talk in the morning? What do you do for a happy hour? What do you do for dinner? And think about all those different elements and then break it into three personas. So you've got the classic sort of like cottage garden-y look. You've got a little more natural design. And then you've got the really stark, like very clean lines. And so at least kind of like the USDA zone that we just talked about, it just gives you a place to start from and see like, maybe I align here, but I've got a little dash of that in there as well. And then you can take all those, what hopefully were scary design elements and apply it through those different personas and start building a space for yourself. That's cool, man. I mean, I, I would put myself in like a blended 70-30 of clean lines plus natural and the cottage doesn't appeal to me as much. And yeah. then like Jock on our team... I would say he's like 85, 15 the other way. Um, so I don't know if you're listening and you're a cottage gardener, send me some photos. We kind of want someone else who has that aesthetic because neither of us do. But dude, it's been great having you on the show. You can check all of yeah, Ryan's you. out in the podcast description this week and hope to have you back on, Ryan. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much.